Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Thanks so much for joining us for this virtual U Miami Health Talk, Imaging Guided Interventions for Pain Relief, New Alternatives for Chronic Pain. Highly anticipated uh, topic tonight. Many and many of you are joining us, um, which obviously tells us a lot of people live in pain. I'm your moderator for this evening, health journalist Ileana Bravo. The talk is presented by the University of Miami Health System Department of Radiology and Division of Musculoskeletal Radiology. Now we invite you to learn more about U Health's radiology department by visiting umiamihealth.org slash radiology. We will tell you ahead of time that you will need a referring physician to schedule a consultation with this team whom you will hear from tonight, but the number is 305-243-5512. We will hear from our radiology expert tonight, Dr. Jean Jose, who will explore the following topics. The key benefits of ultrasound guided imaging for musculoskeletal conditions, the key differences among various injections for pain management, including steroids and viscose supplementation biologics, and newer procedures, including geniculate artery embolization and nerve blocks. The discussion will encompass the applications for both acute and chronic pain and inflammation. Now, at the end of our experts presentation, you are going to have a unique opportunity to reach out and ask direct questions of him. Use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Take a quick look at your device and see, locate that. It says Q&A, and that's where you're going to enter them as you think of them. Uh, we're going to prepare them for our expert to address at the end of his presentation. So now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Jean Jose. Dr. Jean Jose is board certified by the American Board of Radiology and holds medical licenses in Florida and New York. As an attending physician, he has been awarded several teaching awards and recognitions. Dr. Jose is involved in several research studies. His research interests are diagnostic and interventional musculoskeletal imaging, magnetic resonance imaging of articular cartilage, tumors, peripheral nerve pathologies, and sport-related injuries. He has published more than 118 articles in peer-reviewed medical journals, co-authored book chapters on orthopedic imaging, and has presented at more than 35 national and international medical conferences and at more than 45 scientific meetings. Thank you very much. So good evening, everyone. So for the next uh, 30 minutes or so, I am going to present a very basic overview of what we do uh, in musculoskeletal imaging and uh, emphasize uh, traditional treatments and more importantly, newer treatments for uh, patients with chronic pain throughout their musculoskeletal system. Um, I run my practice here um, at the Lennar Foundation Medical Center, where I serve as director of imaging. Um, we are a, a diverse and very well-trained group of technologists, nurses, nurse practitioners, which uh, we put together specifically with an orthopedic imaging emphasis. And our team is specialized um, in all aspects of musculoskeletal imaging, extending from nuclear medicine, x-rays, uh, MR, CT, and ultrasound. So... We have dedicated schedulers, dedicated nurses. Our ultrasound technologists are the finest ultrasound technologists in the southeastern United States, uh, and they, they're fully dedicated to musculoskeletal imaging. Um, we also have specialized technologists in MRI and CT with the latest equipment, so 3T MRI, state-of-the-art. So we are very proud of our team here at Lennar, and again, we emphasize that not all imaging is the same. So one of the strengths of U Health is the quality of our imaging and of our staff. And the fact, as you will see, that we emphasize research-driven treatments. Um, so we, we, we emphasize research and education. And in addition to our wonderful technologists, nurses, and nurse practitioner, we also have our medical students, residents, and fellows of several departments, including radiology, uh, PMNR, and orthopedics, that will rotate with us and you will uh, be exposed to them if you choose to seek uh, treatment with us. So there are several key steps to the effective uh, treatment of chronic pain and it all begins with a clinical exam. So a comprehensive clinical exam by our colleagues 
whether they are primary care physicians, dedicated, non-operative, a sports medicine uh, or anesthesia or PMNR physicians, um, or our different surgical specialists, they will do a clinical exam. They will obtain necessary laboratory data, and they will also order specific imaging exams, whether it's uh, x-ray, CT, nuclear medicine, MRI, or ultrasound, and the combination of the laboratory, the physical exam findings, and the imaging findings will then dictate uh, the next treatment. So once we have the correct diagnosis, we then, if appropriate, will uh, proceed with the image-guided intervention. Now, the type of image guidance depends on the type of procedure. And in order for us to be able to accommodate you, we require a specific order from the referring doctor specifying not only what they want injected, so whether it's a corticosteroid, hyaluronic acid, an orthobiologic, um, but also uh, we require insurance authorization prior to you coming to visit us. And this is what I mean. So here is an example of a CT-guided spine injection. In this case, this is an interlaminar epidural injection uh, that we would use to help someone with chronic back pain. We can also guide uh, our different percutaneous instruments by MR guidance. We routinely do this, for example, for breast procedures. Um, we can also do these for musculoskeletal conditions. Um, fluoroscopically guided interventions can also be done. Uh, there are pros and cons to each. And then our workhorse is musculoskeletal ultrasound. And there are different reasons why we prefer to do the majority of our interventions using musculoskeletal ultrasound. For one, it gives us a lot of physiologic information. So as part of your visit, if you choose to visit our clinic, you will have a dedicated technologist do a scan to confirm the initial clinical suspicion. So for example, you may have someone with shoulder pain that an x-ray may show osteoarthritis. But when we do the diagnostic ultrasound, we may pick up a rotator cuff tear, a bursitis, um, inflammation of the biceps tendon. And with things like color Doppler, we can assess the uh, active inflammation. And so that may hone down the diagnosis. So people with end-stage arthritis may be asymptomatic from their arthritis, and their pain may not be coming from the arthritis. It may be coming from an inflamed tendon or an inflamed nerve around the joint. So using modalities like ultrasound, we can better direct the treatment um, and get better results. The other really big advantage of ultrasound is that almost anyone can undergo an MS, uh, a musculoskeletal ultrasound. It does not require radiation, so we don't have to be shielded. We don't have to inject iodinated contrast, so we don't have to worry about allergies or other potential negative side effects, renal problems, et cetera, that we would if we were doing other uh, imaging modalities. The typical type of injection is like this. So again, if I'm targeting an injection, I haven't discussed yet the type of things that we inject, but using ultrasound, we can target very specific areas within the body part. In this case, we're injecting the shoulder. We can target the uh, subdeltic subacromial bursa. There are two joints in the shoulder, the acromioclavicular and the glenohumeral, so we can target those. We can even target uh, tendon sheets, like the long head of the biceps tendon sheet that you'll see in a second. So we can make very, very specialized uh, treatments depending on the pathology, and we can see this real time. So what you're seeing here is the needle placing the corticosteroid into the glenohumeral joint in real time. So our accuracy is much, much higher. You may have experienced um, other uh, providers perform these injections, what we call blind, without image guidance. And what research has shown is for the vast majority of these, of these injections, the efficacy and accuracy of the injection significantly increase when image guidance is used and correct image guidance is used. So ultrasound is really ideal for most of our musculoskeletal imaging and musculoskeletal interventions. As I mentioned, almost everyone can undergo an ultrasound, whether you have a pacemaker, whether you're claustrophobic, whether you're uncomfortable in certain positions, these things would be uh, would preclude you oftentimes for getting things like an MRI, but an ultrasound is not a problem for you. Uh, ultrasound can actually uh, refine uh, finer detail than MRI. So we can get a higher quality image, especially in a superficial structure, 
using ultrasound that we can with MRI. We can scan in a dynamic real-time fashion. So we can put the probe exactly where you have pain. And that is critical as we all age, we all start seeing many different changes throughout our body. So it's critical that we ignore those changes that are not clinically significant, but focus on where the pain is and target the treatment there. And ultrasound allows us to do that. We can put the probe exactly where, where it hurts. Orthopedic hardware, like if you have an implant or a prior surgical plate or screws from, let's say, hardware fixation for a fracture, the ultrasound can effectively uh, scan that. We don't get a lot of artifact from that. And then again, we can allow more comfortable patient positioning, which is really important in a patient with chronic pain. Some, some, uh, some areas they can't do. So what are the common musculoskeletal conditions that we treat? Again, we're very specific, we're very granular as to what we're treating because we want to get uh, better outcomes. So the, the majority of the things that we do, we're going to be dealing with arthritis, whether it's degenerative arthritis or post-traumatic arthritis in the setting of osteoarthritis, or if we're dealing with an inflammatory arthropathy like rheumatoid arthritis or juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. And so we can effectively treat these uh, in different ways. We can deal with tendon inflammation and degeneration or tears. We can deal with um, bursitis, which are inflammation of these sacs that occur usually around joints uh, and inflammation of tendon sheets. Um, a lot of people, regardless of what their underlying pathology is, whether it's one tendon tear or osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis, they may have secondary problems, which are the more acute reason for their pain. So one of the common culprits in the shoulder is adhesive capsulitis. Today alone, I dealt with a gentleman that had a full thickness rotator cuff tear, but his problem wasn't the rotator cuff tear. His problem was he developed frozen shoulder. So we're treating the frozen shoulder and not the rotator cuff tear. So uh, accurate diagnosis is essential. Sometimes in the setting of inflammation, we have deposition of calcium and we can wash that calcium out under ultrasound. We may develop cysts uh, in and around areas of arthritis or inflammation. These are known as ganglion cysts around different joints. And in the knee, there's one very famous cyst, which is called the Baker cyst, where we can drain these under ultrasound or CT and that will alleviate pain. Um, and then in terms of nerves, Different nerves can become either inflamed or entrapped, and there's many different things that we can do through image guidance uh, to help with that. So based on the accurate diagnosis, this is a very busy slide, but it kind of gives you an overview of what we can do. So if there's fluid, we can aspirate it. If there's a mass, we can biopsy. If there's calcium, we can wash it. If there is different forms of inflammation, we can inject. So what do we inject? Um, we can inject what we call viscosupplementation, which is hyaluronic acid. It comes under different names and it can be a little bit confusing, but in essence, what hyaluronic acid is, it's um, a synthetic version of something that's normally found in your joints, in the articular cartilage. And it's meant to restore physiologic viscoelasticity uh, in your synovial fluid. So it helps to restore things that you've lost in the setting of arthritis. It may also help with the inflammation associated with arthritis um, that we, we see either in the setting of osteoarthritis or an inflammatory arthropathy. I'll talk a little bit about the orthobiologics, uh, mainly uh, something called PRP, which is platelet-rich plasma. And then our workhorse are corticosteroids, which help with inflammation. Um, and so let me show you some key differences between these. Um, and I'll try to simplify it as best as I can. So as I mentioned, corticosteroids are a workhorse. We have a long history of treating patients with corticosteroids. So we have a lot of data from, from multiple years of research, and we know that they're very effective at treating inflammation. What is the downside of it? Well, there, it can propitiate infection. So if your underlying problem is an infection, or if you are predisposed to infection, and the injection of corticosteroids, predominantly recurrent corticosteroids, may lead to an infection. So we have to be careful with that. Uh, repeated steroid injections, you may have heard that you don't want to have more than a couple of injections of steroid. Well, that is true. Why? Because we know that uh, prolonged intra injection of steroids 
can lead to worsening arthritis. It can lead to worse, worsening cartilage degeneration. It can also predispose you to tendon ruptures and ligament tears. So you have to be very careful as to what dose and where we put, put the steroid and how many times we give the steroid. But that doesn't mean that we cannot give it. In the acute setting, when there is inflammation in the correct patient, it is very, very helpful. In terms of the visco supplementation, the hyaluronic acid injections, they work well for certain types of osteoarthritis, namely that of the knee. So it doesn't have a lot of the negative side effects of corticosteroids, but um, it is not without its own risk. Some people are allergic to the components. It's a synthetic uh, formulation. So some people have allergies to that, so we cannot give it. And also in the immediate uh, injection period within the first few days, you can get an acute inflammation that can be quite painful. It's called a flare response. Um, so you just have to be aware that that can happen. In terms of the orthobiologics, unfortunately, there's a lot of misconceptions in the community as to what these orthobiologics can, can do. Um, the PRP is your own body. We, we basically take your blood, we spin it, and then we take the platelet-rich components and we inject that into areas of inflammation or tear. So a lot of the negative side effects that I mentioned with the first two are not there. But what are the problems with it? Well, number one, I cannot inject local anesthetic where I put the PRP. So they, the injection itself can be quite painful. It can also incite an inflammatory reaction early on. So it's not the least comfortable injection that I do with the first two. I will usually numb the area really well so you don't feel it. With PRP, I cannot do that sometimes because it will deactivate the PRP. And then lastly, stem cells. There's a lot of potential for the different types of stem cells. We are currently not offering that to our patients because we have not seen um, good research-based results for most of the uh, musculoskeletal conditions. PRP we're comfortable with, but stem cell we're not. We're researching it, but we're not there yet. So it holds a lot of great potential, but we're really too early to know and there are many potential uh, negative side effects. In terms of the corticosteroids, we're very specific as to the type of corticosteroids. We like our referring physicians to let us know whether we're gonna be injecting Kenalog, Celestone, Depomedrol. Every each one has its own indication and um, uh, its own risk benefit profile. So we, 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 uh, we like the clinicians to be involved in, the, in us in the decision-making. Um, we will inject local anesthetics with that. It's not that the local anesthetic will there to treat you long-term. It's just to make you comfortable during the position, uh, procedure and immediately after to allow you to get home. It takes a few days for the corticosteroids to work. So during that period, the local anesthetics are there to help you get home, get comfortable, uh, take some oral anti-inflammatory until the steroid that we've injected starts to work. But again, it takes a little bit of time. Um, and then I always get asked, is this going to have a negative side effect? Remember, these corticosteroids are not the type that bodybuilders use. These are anti-inflammatories. So what they do is that they decrease these substances in your body that are produced as a consequence of inflammation or during inflammation, and those are mainly called cytokines. So they help to downregulate cytokines, and that anti-inflammatory effect can be eternal. So if the underlying cause of your inflammation is cured, the corticosteroid will quiet the inflammation. And as long as you don't have another trigger, you're done. It's one and done, which is the ideal scenario. If you have the underlying problem, whether it's osteoarthritis, whether it's a meniscal tear, et cetera, the, the inflammation may return at a later date and you may choose and you may be a candidate for another corticosteroid injection much later in the fu future. But again, uh, understanding the negative side effects, the negative profile. So we have to be careful with that because of the potential cartilage uh, problems that we get uh, over time. And then we have to be careful injecting corticosteroids in several at-risk populations, not only the immunocompromised, but also obviously our pregnant patients because we don't want to create any negative side effects to their babies or even postpartum moms. We have to be careful. And then our diabetics, it is safe to inject corticosteroids to diabetic patients that are controlled. The systemic effect is not that significant. You may see a transient increase in your blood sugars within 12 to 48 hours after the shot. It's usually very minimal and can easily be controlled as long as you're aware of it.
In terms of the, the fiscal supplementation, again, depending on the type of insurance you have and depending on what your clinician prefers, we can inject different types of formulation. Um, different manufacturers will make uh, different ones. They're pretty much the same theory behind them as to why they work. Um, and again, if you ever see a clinician order one or the other, it has to do with their preference, their track record, and more importantly, um, your insurance. Some insurance will pay for one and they won't pay for the others. So there are some contraindications. So there are some scenarios where we will not inject this. So if you have an active infection, we will not be injecting corticosteroids. We will not be injecting uh, the visco supplementations, obviously allergies. And then we have to be careful on uh, coagulation. So if you have bleeding problems, having said that, the vast majority of our MSK interventions, you don't have to stop anticoagulation because we're using very thin needles. And we have done research showing that there's really no long-term negative effect of doing these basic uh, interventions on patients with anticoagulation. We are okay doing it. And we were the group that actually uh, produced the research for that. Um, there are some classic complications that you have to be aware of. So hematomas, infections, uh, transient uh, nerve issues, failure to relieve pain, the flare response, and also you may have some skin discoloration if we're injecting close to the skin. Um, these are known complications that you have to be aware of. In terms of the orthobiologics, I covered all of this. A couple of key uh, points here. It's usually not covered by insurance. And so if you are interested in receiving an orthobiologic to help promote healing, you have to understand that your insurance may not cover it. And there is an uh, out-of-pocket ex uh, expense for that. This is the reason why we are not injecting stem cells right now because we are not convinced that this is actually working. Uh, PRP, yes, stem cells, no, which is why we wouldn't inject these on our patients without showing it. We usually inject these orthobiologics or more specifically PRP into areas of either inflammation or tear. How do they work? I don't want to go into the weeds and behind the science, but more importantly to let you know, it's your own platelets, which we are taking out we're concentrating and we're reintroducing into the areas of inflammation or tear. Why they work, they have these alpha granules and within the alpha granules, you have all of these growth factors. And these different, these are just four of them. There are many more. They promote all of the things that we want. So we are accelerating our own body's ability to heal, whether that is by promote, promoting the growth of blood vessels, uh, promoting the formation of extracellular matrices, by promoting uh, fibroblasts um, and epithelialization. So there's many different things that they do to help. Um, and we're just helping your body heal it. How is this done? We will draw your blood, we will spin your blood, and then we will re-inject your blood uh, back into that. Um, so here's an example of one of the common indications for PRP. This is for lateral epicondylitis. So uh, patients that like to play a lot of tennis, that so-called tennis elbow. So this is what it would look like. I'm placing the ultrasound probe into the area of the tendon inflammation. And so this is a tendon that has inflammation with lateral epicondylitis, and I'm guiding the needle into the area of tear. This is a painful procedure. Again, I cannot give local anesthetic where I'm putting the PRP because it will deactivate it. Um, so there, there is some discomfort, but this we've gotten good results with in the right uh, 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 patients. Now, I want to finish the talk speaking about something that we're very, very excited about, which is geniculate artery embolization. Um, so the theory behind this is that we will be introducing through a catheter some microspheres, microparticles, and they will help to occlude very small vessels around the joints. We started with knee. This is based on a lot of research that's been done in Europe and in Asia. We're one of the few centers in the United States that are doing this. And this is specifically targeted targeted for patients with mild to moderate osteoarthritis, which are not ready to undergo joint replacement, and by which the other things that I've talked about, the steroids, the visco supplementation, the PRP, are not working. So in this case, we will introduce the catheter, we will target those small geniculate uh, vessels, and we will occlude them. We are doing this in conjunction with the Department of Interventional Radiology, uh, Dr. Shivan Bhatia, who is the chair uh, and is a pioneer in these technologies. He's perfected the technique in, uh, of microembolization for prostate and uterine problems, and now he is targeting 
uh, the, the knee uh, in osteoarthritis. So again, we're blocking blood flow in areas around the knee that are inflamed and painful, and this will result in the uh, reduction of inflammation and pain. Um, relief usually begins within two weeks after the procedure, and we're doing this on very specific patients, patients that have osteoarthritis that are mild to, uh, mild to moderate, um, and, and it can help very much. So this is the contact information for Dr. Bhatia. Um, if you're interested in learning more about this procedure, which I strongly encourage those that, that have mild to moderate osteoarthritis and they're having chronic pain and haven't responded to the other therapies, please contact him. This is the contact information in the email address. The good news is that the study that Dr. Bhatia and myself are doing, we, are, uh, we have a grant. And so the grant for, for the selected patients will cover the cost of x-rays, the MRI, and the treatment. So this is a very promising study uh, that we're currently undergoing at UHealth. We're the only center um, locally that is doing this and one of the few in the United States. So I strongly recommend those uh, to reach out to Dr. Bhatia. And then, um, so the next steps, if you're looking at the other treatments that I covered, if you think you may benefit from these uh, interventions, please reach out to your clinicians, your primary care, your, your specialists, uh, speak to your doctors, they will advise you further on this information at what is best suited for you. And we will then, if, they, if you both agree, we will get an order and you come to see us and we'll either perform the diagnostic exam and or the intervention based on what your clinician is order. These are some of the YouTube uh, videos that UHealth has published. It talks a little bit about our center. It also talks about musculoskeletal imaging. So I encourage those of you who are interested, please follow these links. We've also set up a, um, and this is what it looks like. It gives you an idea behind our team here at Lennar. We have um, over 40 something members of our team here at Lennar. Um, we also have a little bit more information through these YouTube videos, which I've put together of different body parts, the classic body parts, which we evaluate with ultrasound. And then lastly, we've created a web page here at Lennar, uh, which we'll be putting in some information for you, for those of you that wanna learn a little bit more about the services that we're offer, offering. And with that, I hand over the, uh, the last slide. So in conclusion, image guided procedures lead to better outcome, uh, uh, outcomes compared to blinded procedures. There are many different types of therapeutic interventions that can be um, performed to alleviate pain, but the key is the correct diagnosis and the correct order. And as we said, we are one of the few centers in the United States uh, that are doing this embolization techniques for, uh, we've started with the knee, um, and I'm also doing um, some peripheral nerve work that is showing a lot of uh, promising results. And so please talk to your referring physicians and, and obtain an order. And with that, I'll end. Thank you, Dr. Jose. Um, highly impressive uh, because we appreciate how well you communicate and sort of breaking it down. And as I launch into these questions, the, the first one that caught my ear from someone who has knee pain, like so many people, um, you're saying that you can use the diagnostic tool of ultrasound, not MRI necessarily, to come up with this diagnosis. And because so many people are averse to MRIs. Yeah, the combination of an x-ray, for example, which is a pretty routine exam, the x-ray will show us the morphology of the bone um, so we can pick up the arthritic changes, obviously exclude tumors in the bone and, and um, fractures. Um, but if an x-ray shows osteoarthritis in combination with an ultrasound where we will see things around the joint, such as a joint effusion, a Baker cyst, uh, sometimes it's not the arthritis that's the problem. Sometimes it may be a Baker cyst or a ganglion cyst, or it may be a tendon around the joint that's becoming inflamed. So ultrasound is very, very helpful. And it's a very quick exam. There, is, there are no negative side effects from the ultrasound. Um, so I encourage claustrophobic patients or other patients that are not MRI candidates um, to, to seek uh, MSK ultrasound. Yeah. Of course, once they get that referring, uh, you know, uh, patient, rather physician to send them to your team. All right, let's get into um, the first question on what is the best pain relief? And I know you broke it down, but let's hear it again for MCL, a meniscal tear. So MCL injuries are, it depends on the severity of the injury. Um, so the clinical uh, exam is paramount. They will clinically assess uh, 
the medial collateral ligament injury. There's different maneuvers that can be done to determine the degree of injury and laxity. That is usually followed uh, if the clinician feels that something else is going on concomitantly, like a meniscal tear or an ACL tear, et cetera, they will order an MRI. Um, so depending on the severity of the MCL injury, um, a grade one, which is a sprain, is usually treated conservatively in isolation. Uh, the patient may or may not be braced, and then they'll usually be referred to physical therapy, and that's enough. If the MCL tear is of a higher grade, like a, what we call a grade two, uh, and the patient is not responding to conservative treatment, we may augment it with a biologic. So PRP is helpful for partial thickness tears of the MCL that have not completely healed. A full thickness MCL tear, predominantly one that's distal by the tibial insertion, those are usually treated surgically. And the reason for that is that a distal MCL tear that is complete will often retract and be away from its anatomic uh, normal insertion. And that requires a surgeon to bring back that, tent, that ligament back to its anatomical footprint because that separation, that retraction will not allow it to heal properly. So the long answer to a short question is, it depends on the type of MCL injury. Yeah, and that, that's why the deep dive into the diagnostics of it. Okay, question two, can these solutions, all of the ones that you laid out for different types of injections and so forth, be used for degenerative back issues in order to avoid surgery? Yeah, uh, both myself and more importantly, my colleagues, both in interventional radiology and PMNR, there is a large range of procedures that can be done uh, beyond just corticosteroid injections, but there are things like rhizotomies and there's different other procedures that can be done to alleviate chronic back pain in patients. Again, it depends on the diagnosis. We need to first find out where is the pain coming from? Is it a herniated disc? Is it a facet joint that's uh, irritated? Is there something around the spine that's causing the problem? So uh, we first need to lead the correct diagnosis, the targeted diagnosis. Uh, all of us, as we age, have degenerative changes of our spine. It's part of normal aging. And so as we get more sophisticated with our imaging, we're much better at detecting signs of aging, but that not, may not be necessarily clinically significant. So if you ever hear these stories of different patients, so-and-so had really bad arthritis, but he runs every day, he or she runs every day, and so-and-so has just a little bit of arthritis, but they're, they're going to need a joint replacement or et cetera. It's the subtle changes. We don't treat the image, we treat the patient. So, and, and there's a lot of other things that may be going on beyond just the normal signs of aging. Okay. What treatments are available for uh, fibromyalgia and other nerve pain? So fibromyalgia is usually not treated with image-guided um, interventions. It usually requires a more systemic approach. Uh, there are certain oral medications that can be uh, uh, given uh, for fibromyalgia and um, a lot of work has been done on the physical therapy and rehabilitation side of it to get people moving again. Um, that's a little bit beyond the scope of what we do in MSK radiology. We don't deal with fibromyalgia. Now, that's not to say that patients with fibromyalgia may not have an inflammation of a tendon or a bursitis or, or arthritis. So we will be able to deal with those problems in a patient with fibromyalgia. Oftentimes, our patients suffering from fibromyalgia they attribute their individual focal problems to the fibromyalgia, which is a problem. So if you have fibromyalgia and you happen to develop an inflammation of the bursa in the shoulder, we want to make sure that we are correctly diagnosing the bursitis, which we can treat with a percutaneous injection and physical therapy from the underlying overall problem of fibromyalgia, which is something that we would, would not necessarily treat uh, in our field. Doctor, you mentioned that uh, excessive corticosteroid injections can uh, damage cartilage. How about nerve damage caused by any of these types of treatment? That's an excellent question. We work very closely with our neurosurgeon and neurologist. We have a what we call a peripheral nerve group. We meet once a month to go over uh, challenging cases and determine their interventions. And beyond just percutaneous injections of steroids or uh, ablation. Sometimes we want to actually uh, try to neutralize nerves by injecting alcohol or phenol um, purposefully. Um, 
there's a lot of, so there's a lot of different treatments that we can do for uh, peripheral nerve pain, uh, but we have to be careful because excessive treatments, uh, including steroids over time, can lead to nerve damage. Uh, it's also very important to, to guide the needle, if, for example, if you're doing a perineural injection, to put the steroid to around the nerve, not within it. And oftentimes we have seen people having longstanding nerve problems from prior interventions where they have actually placed the needle or some other instrument and damaged the nerve. So it's very important. Uh, it's a very subspecialized area and we have to be careful how we treat these people and who's treating these people because longstanding damage can be caused to a nerve, whether the steroid is injected into the nerve and the needle gets into the nerve. It's a completely different problem. In the setting of corticosteroids, in perineural injections, you don't want to touch the inside of the nerve. You want to be injecting around the nerve. It's a perineural injection. Mm. Um, you hear so often people talking about their severely damaged lower back and that they have stenosis and they have all these uh, types of things. Um, is repeated injections of uh, corticosteroids or others really going to make a difference or do they really, are they going to end up having surgery? Right. It depends on, remember, um, and that's why I went over the how these medicines work. So a corticosteroid is just an anti-inflammatory. And what I tell my patients is, so let's assume you have an underlying brain tumor and that's giving you a headache. I can keep giving you Advil and maybe the Advil will help you with the pain for about one or two hours. But eventually the pain comes back because you haven't dealt with the underlying problem. So the Advil will help with the short-term inflammation and pain relief but the underlying problem will remain. Now, if you keep taking Advil over time, trying to deal with the brain tumor, you're going to develop secondary problems from the Advil. You're going to get GI problems, et cetera. It's the same thing with the corticosteroid. So yes, repeated corticosteroid injections are going to cause negative side effects. And to answer your question, if the underlying problem causing the inflammation has not been corrected, the steroid will not work in the long term. How about a severely damaged knee with severe damage in the cartilage? Are, is, are we talking about the synvisc and all these other injections being sort of something to just soothe the joint or does it help with pain as well? Is it a combo? It's both. And that's an excellent question. We routinely get asked to inject, for example, the visco supplementation in patients with end-stage arthritis. So we know that the standard treatment for end-stage osteoarthritis of the knee or the hip is joint replacement. So why would we be transiently injecting these people? Because a lot of them are not surgical candidates. So we are buying them time. Maybe they have concomitant heart disease, or maybe they're dealing with cancer, or maybe they're of a certain age that they don't qualify for joint replacement, or sometimes... Uh, the time required for them to rehabilitate from joint replacement, they, they cannot afford either they have work or family responsibilities. So the purpose is the purpose of the visco supplementation in that scenario is to give that person time. I, we know that the patient has end stage arthritis. We know that this is not curative, but maybe we can give them three to six months of pain relief to get these other things taken care of. So it depends on the patient, their individual condition, and what their outcomes are. What are the age ranges that you were dealing with in most of your patient population? Are people getting younger that suddenly have more joint pain? And what's the spectrum on, on the back end, the older patient that's more active, that is still working out and playing golf? Yeah. So we're seeing as we become more health conscious, as, as a society, especially in South Florida, we all want to look good. And so we are we are doing more and more athletic activities. We do know that over the long term, athletic activity, excessive athletic activity will wear your joints potentially faster. Also, if you have an injury earlier, so if you're participating in sports and you get hurt earlier on, there is, you're going to see an earlier onset of arthritis in a younger population. And we are definitely seeing that. So for example, if you are uh, playing soccer and you you have a really bad knee injury where you tear your menisci and you tear your cruciate ligaments, you definitely require surgical intervention. And that's the surgical intervention there is to 
prevent the onset of osteoarthritis or delay it. It's not to cure it. We know that the trauma, if it's bad enough, will lead to osteoarthritis. And we're going to see end-stage osteoarthritis in younger patients that have undergone prior trauma, for example. And so we're more and more often seeing younger patients with osteoarthritis. And that's a very big problem. Why? Because we do not want to be doing joint replacement on young people. Why? Because the joints are not meant to last a lifetime. So in the best surgeon's hand, in the best, best clinical scenario, let's say you get 20 years, 25 years from a, a joint. So at 25 or 30, so if you have a 30-year-old with joint replacement at 30, by the time they're 60, statistically speaking, they'll most likely require a revision surgery. And those are tougher surgeries. They have to take more bone. And so we're trying to manage these people without having to resort to joint replacement at such a young age, which is where these alternative treatments come in. Here's an interesting question. Someone with a defibrillator, um, can they safely receive imaging for knee pain issues? And of course, we talked about ultrasound versus MRI or scan. So address this, please. Yeah. So just because you have a uh, either a pacemaker, defibrillator, or some other electronic medical device, we're more and more seeing patients with different nerve stimulators, um, different types of pain pumps or insulin pumps. We can safely image those, uh, for example, via MRI. So what do we do here at UHealth? We acquire the information of the device beforehand, and we will screen those patients, and we will follow the recommended manufacturers. Um, it's usually in the, in the device information package. They will, the, the manufacturer will tell us, this device is safe for three Tesla magnets using this, or 1.5. Now, older implants, um, occasionally we will not be able to clear for MRI, but the good news is that we have other imaging modalities that can provide the necessary information. So for example, if you happen to have a patient with an older pacemaker, let's say an international patient that received this outdated technology many years ago in a foreign country, and they happen to come to you health with shoulder pain, and we need to know if the rotator cuff is torn. Well, we may not be able to do the MRI, but we can do an ultrasound. And if the ultrasound doesn't give us all the information that we need, then we can do a CAT scan with contrast in the joint. It's called a CT arthrogram. So that's the benefit of dealing with a multimodality group of subspecialists where we work together and we find better alternatives for our patients that you may not see in the community. Another thing that you said that I think um, we I keyed in on and that is that the most effective injections into those joints would be those that are ultrasound guided, meaning you are seeing that little picture on that screen of where that needle is delivering that medicine, right? That's exactly right. And this has been shown not only in the radiology literature, but in the orthopedic literature, the rheumatology literature, and ultrasound is not ultrasound, fluoroscopy, CT, doesn't only belong to radiologists, it belongs to all clinicians. So we have more and more our PMNR physicians becoming experts in fluoroscopically and ultrasound-guided injections. Our primary care physicians, whether they are sports medicine, PMNR, rheumatology, they are using these technologies. So I, I relate these or I equate these technologies like a stethoscope. Just because I'm a radiologist doesn't mean that I don't know how to use a stethoscope to listen to your heart and lungs. A properly trained physiatrist, a properly trained anesthesiologist, orthopedic surgeon, et cetera, they are trained to use ultrasound. I train them. Those residents and fellows rotate with me here in my service, and I'm very passionate about making sure that everyone is trained so that we can all help our patients uh, with their problems, including chronic pain. Dr. Jose, can you discuss prolotherapy? Do you offer it? What's the duration and success rate? We do offer trigger point injections on a very specific subset of patients. It's not meant for a general population. Uh, I personally do not offer prolotherapy. I haven't seen, uh, again, we are very research driven. Now that's not to say that alternative methods have not been uh, shown to be, uh, to have efficacy in certain patient populations. Um, but we are hospital-based, we are university and academic practice. We rely on traditional methods of processing data. And so we have yet to see properly conducted studies 
where prolotherapy would work in a larger patient population. So that is why we have not adopted that. For example, if the insurance companies will not pay for it, I don't feel comfortable charging my patients with something that I'm not convinced will benefit them. So I don't want our patients having out-of-pocket expenses on this. So we're very careful what we offer. We, we, we uh, base it on scientific rigor and previously published reports. Um, I have not heard of this, but is GAE the same as genicular nerve block? No. Uh, so GAE, genicular artery embolization, Dr. Bhatia would uh, target the small arteries around the knee and cause a, a small block of the very tiny ones. And by doing that, reduce inflammation. We also do peripheral nerve work where we're targeting the nerves. And when we do that, we will numb the nerves with a local anesthetic. We can also provide longer standing anti-inflammatory effect with corticosteroids. So that's the geniculate nerve blocks that I'm talking about. And in those patients that have knee pain, where we have injected lidocaine and or corticosteroids, and they have shown a transient improvement, right? A short-term improvement, but the pain returns. But we've proven that by doing this, they get pain relief. Then our interventional radiology colleagues will go in and our PMNR colleagues, et cetera, they will go in and do more permanent nerve ablation, either with a radiofrequency probe um, or with, I, I mentioned earlier, the ablations, the phenol and the alcohol. We're more and more doing these RF, radio frequency uh, ablations of these peripheral nerves. But again, it's not going to be something you start with because the ablation tends to be permanent damage. We don't want to damage those nerves and, uh, permanently if we haven't first proven that that's really the source of pain. And by doing these test injections um, earlier, we can prove that, yep, we, we injected, they got better. Now we know that the problem is truly the nerves, and then we can do more of a permanent uh, treatment for them. If you're interested to learn more about gelicin nerve blockade under ultrasound, if you search the NIH website PubMed and put my name on it, you'll see a paper uh, that we co-published with our colleagues in PMNR uh, about a year ago that, that, that discusses that. Dr. Jose, do you think that there are, are many patients out there just having too many corticosteroids injections and just complaining to each other, be it at the gym or the golf course or, you know, Pilates class saying that doesn't work. None of it works. It, is it because they're just not being treated properly? Um, I don't want to say that they're not being treated properly. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I, you know, I, I'm assuming that the, the, you know, all of our, my colleagues know what they're doing. Um, but it is, uh, in, we do tend to see those patients, and it's usually one of two things. Either the steroid is being targeted to the, not to the area of pain. Again, you don't treat the image, you treat the patient. You have to take the findings of the imaging and put it in a clinical context. So um, if they're targeting the wrong area uh, in the shoulder, they're not going to get pain relief. That's one scenario. The other scenario is, as I mentioned earlier, unless you remove the underlying problem, the problem is the pain's going to come back. So in those patients where they've had repeated injections and they're still having pain, please don't keep doing it. You're going to start getting the complications of the steroid. At that point, you need to find another solution to the problem. And most likely it's going to be surgical um, to correct an underlying uh, tendon, ligament, or bone problem. I think the desperation is, and we see a lot of these questions coming through, is the avoidance of surgery. And, and I think that's why people are, are turning and, and tuning in at, at almost 200 people here tonight to try and listen to how do I relieve my pain without having to go under the knife? And that's why, you know, words from you and your multidisciplinary team to assuage these fears and say, yes, and the technology and the advances are getting better. We're learning yeah. And that's why PRP and stem cell and all of this is, we're on the cusp of all of it. You know, make us feel, what, what's the future gonna bring? The future is definitely bright. Um, we will be having future U Health talks, looking at the different advances that we're doing on multiple fronts at U Health. I'm very proud to work at the university. We're truly at the forefront of innovation and research. And you, as a patient, you need to feel comfortable that when you come to see one of our physicians, understand that there is no financial incentive really for that physician to, for example, 
for a surgeon to want to operate on you. These people are operating on you only if they feel they can help you, and 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 which is may not be the case in a other in another setting. So there's no financial incentive. So if you go to a surgeon and the surgeon tells you, yes, I can make you better here at UHealth, or no, I can't, you need to trust that the surgeon is really looking out for your best interest. That's number one. Number two, we are at the forefront on imaging beyond this intervention. We are working together uh, as, a, as a group under the leadership of our, radi our phenomenal radiology chair, Dr. Ale Alexander McKinney. He is bringing a ton of innovation and we're implementing AI solutions for diagnosis. So as of now, we currently have algorithms in place here at the University of Miami where artificial intelligence is helping us diagnose very specific conditions earlier on, including intracerebral hemorrhage, pulmonary embolism, and more and more of these AI solutions that um, are being developed. We are at the forefront of implementing them here at UHealth. So yes, the future for our local community is very bright here at the U. We're happy to hear that, and we're happy to hear it uh, from the voice of such uh, a, a team leader and an experienced uh, multidisciplinary team, as I said. And, and we can't thank you enough for the generosity of your time tonight, Dr. Jean Jose. Uh, it's been a pleasure to listen to you and to um, our audience for being with us, because our, our program has, we've had to wrap it up, but we squeezed a lot of information in. So um, we just want you to know that the University of Miami Sports Medicine Institute and the UM Health System invite you to learn more, umiamihealth.org slash radiology. And remember, you need a referral in order to see Dr. Uh, Jose's team for clinical evaluation. So complete the survey at the end to give us feedback uh, and suggest future topics. Good night to you and to you, Dr. Jose. And we wish all of you a great night and please stay healthy out there.